Shalom, y'all. It's Batya, and I'm still in Svat. And as always, I have something totally amazing for you today. We are starting a series on the Midrash. Because I just love the Midrash so much. Okay, so I want to go back over... I, I did a small video about the Midrash on the death of Moses, Moshe Rabenu, And I talk a little bit about what the Midrash is. Um, if you want more information, you can head over there and check it out. Um, but I do just want to say, again, the Midrash is ancient biblical commentary. Um, it's not a single book or a single work. It's a collection of different works rooted very strongly in the oral tradition. And um, also, as I said before, to really kind of take in the Midrash, you have to believe it as absolutely literal, absolutely allegorical, absolutely both and absolutely neither all at the same time. Um, Another really important thing to note, I think, is that we're building, and I've talked about this before also, a net of knowledge and just giving some background, okay? Um, there's an expression that says, um, the Torah has 70 faces. What I can kind of equate that to is if me and you are arguing about a chair and you're saying, hey, it's a blue chair. And I'm saying, it's made out of wood. And we're arguing, but we're both right. So it's important to note when you, if one looks at the, um, the commentary in the Talmud and you have all these different rabbis arguing a point, it's really important to note, it's not arguing to see who's right, because if it made it in the Talmud, they're all right. It's about who's more right and in what context, because context is so important, right? So um, sometimes in Midrash, I'll read one thing in one place, and then there will be like a different perspective on, on the same topic in another place. And it doesn't mean that one is not right. It means that right wherever you're standing, you are going to have a different point of view. And that's what it really illuminates. Um, so the great thing about the Midrash is that this is just going to be all kinds of delicious Torah potpourri. It's, there's no, it's just a little from here, from here, from here, stories, anecdotes, this, that, this, and that kind of just all put together. And so you just kind of take it all in. And you'll find that as you continue your learning, that these puzzle pieces will start to form a really amazing picture or that kind of net of learning that I'm always talking about, at least how it worked for me. Um, also, if whatever we're talking about here uh, if you are just really digging the Midrash, then you have to get, can you see? It's not one book, he has a collection of books. Um, uh, books by an author named Josef Deutsch, and he has several of them, and they're all based on a compilation of Talmudic and Midrashic sources, but it's written like a story. And it's so great to read and it will add so much to your life and understanding. And one of my favorite things about this, and I don't know if you can see it. Huh? You see this, all of this are sources. You know I love my sources. Sources, 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 sources. Almost on every page where he talks about differences of opinion or where this comes from or where that comes from. So it's so helpful. If you're interested, and you should definitely be interested, I'm gonna leave information in the description below so you can check that out. It is wonderful, especially if you really wanna share something beautiful and interesting with your children. They'll love it, and you'll love it. And, you know, family Bible bonding time doesn't get better than that. Okay, enough jibber jabber. Let's get down to business. So we're gonna start with creation, right? So we're just gonna start from Bereshit, 
also known as Genesis. Remember, we're working on our vocabulary. Genesis, Bereshit, Bereshit, Genesis. Bereshit means in the beginning. So we're going to talk about different midrashic concepts relating to the creation. So in the beginning, <laughs> see, I told you it was the beginning. In the beginning, uh, before creating the universe, Hashem, Hashem, the name, Hashem is Hashem, is God, is the Almighty, the Lord, the, all the good names, brought seven concepts into existence before he made the universe. Okay, one, Torah. Two, Teshuva. Tshuva, you might also more commonly hear, that means repentance. Although, as I've said before, I don't like the word repentance. It really misses out on the, the belly of the meaning. So, tshuva is to return. Because you have that godly spark in you. And so you're just coming back into contact with what you already have. With that peace of God that's already in your soul. So, repentance, eh, tshuva. And it's not, just to be clear, it's not like, oh, I used to be like this, but now uh, I believe in God, so I already did tshuva. It's taught that we should be doing it every day. Every day we're doing tshuva. Okay, three, Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Four, Gehenom, which would be hell in English, but that is a really bad translation. Mostly because if you're unfamiliar with Jewish concepts and you hear the word hell, there's this, like you conjure up this vision of like de little demons like dancing around uh, with pitchforks amongst flames and the devil and the sulfur raining down. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is very Christian ideology and totally uh, incorrect and... Um, not it. Uh, so we'll talk some more about that later. Bizrat Hashem. Five, the Kisei HaKavod, the throne of his glory. Six, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And seven, the name of Mashiach, the name of Messiah. So um, the world was created only for the purpose of learning Torah and keeping commandments. So that actually came first. To better understand that it's like a blueprint. Like before an architect builds something, he's going to make a blueprint first. And so um, it's, it's very interesting and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But maybe an example that might work is because you have a mother, the Torah told you, a mother and a father, the Torah told you that you need to respect them. That's not how <laughs> that works. The Torah said you need to respect your parents, and as a result of that, you have parents. Are you with me on this? It's not like the world was made and then God made a bunch of rules. It's that this, th this divine word of God created everything it built the structure it's the blueprint of design um so next is tshuva repentance now um hashem knew that the world could not stand um without this concept predating creation we couldn't stand before his judgment so it had to come before um, there's a great story. I'm going to get sidetracked a lot as we go through this about things that I, I personally connect, but there's a story about um, uh, a rabbi, and he sees his students playing chess, and he finds it very interesting, and he asks them about it, and so they start teaching him the rules, and then before they're about to start, and they said, oh, and, and the, the most important rule, uh, uh, an important rule is that once you make a move, you cannot take it back. And the rabbi said, this game is not for me. This is not a Jewish game. Because in the Jewish faith, you can always take something back. You can always take it back. You can always do tshuva. You can always repent. Repent. 
always be better. Three, Gan Eden, that there is a reward for the righteous. Gehenim, that there is punishment for the wicked. And we talked about this in the video, what does God look like? That two of the 13 principles of faith is that I believe with perfect faith that God rewards those that do what he says. And I also believe that equally he punishes those who transgress against him. Five. Uh, his his throne of glory. It's to manifest his his glory in the world. What does that mean? I don't know. Take it in. File it in. We're putting together that puzzle, that net of knowledge I keep a rambling on about. Six, the Mishkan, a place for his shechina, his divine presence to dwell. Seven, the name of Mashiach. So. Uh, that is the goal of everything, really. The redemption and the coming of Mashiach and the complete amazing revelation of Hashem in this world. So his name was made ready. And also a name. What's in a name? A name is, um, it builds the thing that it is. That's why names are so important. Um, names and what you call people. And again, we talked about this again. I'm going to keep, there's so many things I'm going to keep referring back to because they're absolute staples. Words are a creative act. So what you call someone, what you call something creates that thing in the moment, in the past, present, and future, all at the same time. Um, so here's a, a great story, Midrash style. So the Emperor Hadrian asked Rev Yoshua, does the world have a master? And he replied, of course, of course it has a master. Do you think that the world could exist with the, without a creator? And so the emperor asked, well, then who is the creator? And um, Rev Yoshua replied, Hashem, Hashem is the creator of the heaven and the earth. So the emperor replied, if this is true, then why doesn't he reveal himself a couple times a year so that people should fear him? That's impossible, said the rabbi. No man can see me and live. Shmot 3320. Shmot is going to be Exodus. Okay, 3320. I don't believe that, said the emperor. No one can be so great, it's impossible to see him. Rabbi Yoshua left and returned at noon and asked the emperor to step outside. And he said, Emperor, I'm ready to show you God. Will you come outside with me? Curious, Hadrian followed him into the garden. And he told him, okay, look into the sky and look directly into the sun and you will see God. And the emperor replied, are you crazy? Everybody knows it's impossible to look directly into the sun at noon. Exactly, replied Rabbi Yoshua. Note your own words. You admit that no one can gaze at the sun in the full strength of its sign. Zenith. Zenith. Words. But if the sun is only one of the creations of Hashem, one of his servants, how much more so can it be that Hashem's splendor is greater? Then do you expect people to be able to look at him? No. Love it. So then Hashem saw everything he had created and he said it was very good. Um, now let's go into, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories related. Let's go. And this is about the provid providence of God and really illustrates and is to drive home and teach the lesson that there is absolutely zero coincidence or accident in this world. If you believe that anything in your life happens by coincidence, you do not really believe in God. Whoa, whoa, Batya, that's so harsh. That's so harsh. Think about it. If you believe that anything can just happen accidentally or that it's by luck or bad luck or 
any of these things, you don't believe really, not really that God is running the entire world. So Rav Yitzchak was walking along a beach in Kasaria, and suddenly a bone from a skeleton rolled towards him. And he thought, somebody will be hurt today, thought Rav Yanai. And he bent to try and pick up the bone, but it escaped him and it kept rolling. And he said, let me chase after this bone. Surely it was sent on a, mess on a mission. A short time later, a Roman nobleman was strolling along the beach, immersed in his thought, and he did not notice that this bone was rolling towards him. Instead, he tripped over it and he died. And when the Jews of the neighborhood found him lying on the ground, they searched his garments to establish his identity and discovered scrolls of paper in his pockets. These documents were found to, gain, found to contain evil plots against B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. And Hashem had taken revenge against Arasha. Arasha is a wicked person. So, um, next little story. And this is about the wicked, wicked emperor Titus. Uh, you might more familiarly know him as Titus. Uh, in Hebrew, you will hear it Titus. And when he conquered Jerusalem, he entered the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh Kodeshim, in the temple. He tore down the curtains and blasphemed the Almighty and called out, I overcame the king in his own palace. He later boarded a ship to return to Rome, and Hashem attacked the boat with a severe storm and started churning up huge waves, and left, which left the ship in danger of capsizing. The God of this nation apparently only has power in water, since he drowned the generation of the flood. He drowned Paro and his army, and so... Because I overcame him while I was in his own house, he had to wait until I got into the ocean to take care of me. And Hashem said, wicked, I will punish you with one of the smallest of all creatures. Hashem commanded the angel of the sea to calm the waves and Titus arrived safely in Rome where he was greeted with triumphant celebrations. He then went to the bathhouse in order to refresh himself and when he left he was offered his usual bowl of wine. He drank it, and a small gnat flew into his nostril and subsequently penetrated his brain. The gnat stayed alive in his head and began to beat against his forehead, and he could not find any rest day or night, and the gnat incessantly drilled within him. He suffered from it for seven years, and then one day he was passing by a blacksmith, and he heard the banging, and for a brief moment he had respite, and the gnat quieted down. Learning this, he started to bring people to his palace to bang and bang and bang and bang. And then, after 30 days, when the gnat had become accustomed to it, he started resuming pounding inside of his forehead. And when the wicked emperor died, his head was dissected in order to find the gnat, and amazingly enough, it possessed the weight of a fully grown swallow. Now, Hashem punished Titus with mida keneged mida. This is a very important concept. Measure for measure. You will be punished and rewarded measure for measure. So just as Titus had entered a place where he did not belong in the Holy of Holies, so the gnat invaded a place that he did not belong. And since Titus prided himself on his great strength, Hashem punished him with the weakest and tiniest of creatures, a mere net. All right, now, again, we're coming back to one of my favorite things, words. And we're going to talk about the creation of the world in the 10 utter utterances, 10 pronouncements. Um, so in the beginning of Elohim's creation. Now I want to talk to you about the name Elohim. In Hebrew, when we're learning Torah or when we're praying, reading Tehillim, we would say Elohim. But this is a holy name and we only use it for holy purposes. So what that might do is it might confuse you when we're not using it for prayer or study, we're going to change the H sound into a K sound, making it Elohim. So we don't use God's name willy-nilly because it's so holy. Okay. Um, also, what's interesting is that 
Hashem has many, many names, many different names. And that the name Elohim is indicative of justice and judgment. Okay, so he's using this when he created the world because the world has to stand in the righteousness of judgment. Okay, two, he pronounced that a wind, a wind from God hovered over the surface of the waters. Uh, now this is, this is really interesting because what is this wind that hovers over the waters? Wind in Hebrew is ruach, but that can also be like a spirit, okay? Um, sources are explaining that this is really the soul of Mashiach um, to come. Um, and that also, often when you hear about water, it means Torah. And uh, water is also mercy. So like if you think of a mother's womb and it's surrounded by water, it's surrounded by mercy. So the spirit of Mashiach is hovering over the water. He's over our Torah, right? He, and he comes in mercy to redeem us and to reveal God's glory in the world. Three, let there be light, okay? Four, let there be firmament, the land. Five, let the waters gather. Six, let the earth be covered with grass. Seven, let there be luminaries. Okay, this is talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Does anybody have a question yet? But what about the third utterance? We just said that he said, let there be light. So then why on the seventh utterance is he talking about creating the sun and the moon? Is your interest peaked? Let's go. Eight. Let the water swarm abundantly. Nine, let earth bring forth living creatures. 10, let us make man in our image. Let's get into it. So um, starting with this, it's so beautiful that it says in the beginning, God created. And normally what you would see is that a man is named and then his good deeds follow. But this really shows the modesty of Hashem. So let's talk about some other examples of the modesty of Hashem. After hearing a Torah lecture from his teacher, a student should say, thank you, I'm sorry that I troubled you. But when Hashem taught Torah to the nation of Israel at Mount Sinai, the situation was reversed. It was he who said to them, how much I have troubled you. Devarim chapter 1 verse 6. Next, it's usual procedure for the students to enter the classroom first and wait for their teacher to enter after them. Yet when Hashem told the prophet Yehezkel to go to the valley, Hashem was there first waiting for the prophet as it says in Yehezkel chapter 3 verse 22. And I went out to the valley and behold, there was Hashem's honor standing. 3. If a student should become sick, it is the usual custom for his fellow students to come and visit him, and then followed by his teacher to come last. But when Avram was sick, after his circumcision, Hashem was the first visitor, appearing to him before three angels. So nice. So, um, now, when... When the Torah starts, it starts with Bereshit, okay, which begins with the letter Bet. That would be like our equivalent to B. And so when he made the Torah with the word Bereshit and started it with the letter Bet, the letter Aleph, like R-A, was dissatisfied that it had been passed over and it complained to Hashem for 26 generations, I'm the first letter. And I was left out at the beginning of the Torah. And Hashem promised the letter, you will see justice done when I give the Torah to my children. I shall start with only you. When Hashem gave the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, He put the Aleph at the beginning saying, Anochi, I, I am Hashem your God. So what is significant about the fact that Hashem ignored the Aleph and started with the Bet 
is that we live in the physical world of creation. And we usually, we tend to give priority to our physical needs, our material needs, like a bit. A bit, you can relate to like bite or a house or to a uh, bonnet, to build, to build those material things around you. Um, but these are not really our priorities. Studying Torah uh, should be our first priority and not building all the material things and then fitting in the little bit of Torah study we can. The Torah study should be our, our focus and our passion, our real work, and then everything else should come after. So when he put the Aleph into the Ten Commandments, he's showing that the priority, the first thing, the A, the Aleph, is in the Torah. And that's where you should put your focus. So now I want to talk about, let's go to the next page. You know me and my notes. I love my notes. And these are, you know, I'm not going through everything. I'm just picking what I like. This video is already 26 minutes. I wonder if I should just continue it later. No, let's just go for it. Okay. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not talking about everything. I'm just like giving little bits of like, God forbid, I'm not going to say trivia because nothing about it is trivial, but uh, just a little, little from here and here. Torah potpourri. So when, um, I want to talk about the light. So let's go back to the light. So God created light with the third utterance. And then on the seventh utterance, he created the luminaries. That's because when he created the light, it's not the light from the sun that we know it now. It's a very special light called the Oraganus. It's the hidden light. And this is a light he's saving for only the righteous people. It's a spiritual kind of light. It's something that we can't possibly begin to understand. And then he said, hey, I'm not gonna let the people that don't deserve it benefit from this in any way. I'm gonna save it for those that do my will. And in the meantime, I'm gonna give them the sun and the moon and the stars. Um, additionally, when Hashem was gathering the waters to uh, form everything, uh, the waters were not happy about this. And actually, um, I don't know if I have this in my other notes or it's just bubbling forth in my brain, but it's so great. He had to kind of, in essence, make a deal with the water that once he put it in place and the children were coming out of Israel, it would split for them because it was completely against its nature. So when, the, when, he, when Hashem gathered the water, the water was really unhappy about being confined and he threatened to like just bust over and overcome the land. And so Hashem spoke to the water sternly and he put in a border of sand to keep the water in its place. So whenever the water tries to come up and it sees the sand, it remembers the word of God and recedes back into the water. As it says in uh, Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, chapter 5, verse 22. Do you not fear me? Will you not tremble at my presence? For I have set as a boundary for the sea an everlasting decree so that the sea cannot pass it. Now let's talk about the trees. So initially when God made the trees, he intended the tree to not only bear fruit, but to be fruit itself. Meaning that now we can only eat the fruit from it. But initially, it was meant that you could eat the branches and the bark as well. And the, true, the, the fruit tree um, defied God and made only that it would have fruit. Its reasoning being that if all of me is edible, then people will eat all of me and there will be nothing left of me and I can't survive. And so... Um, this is to show us that often we rationalize our own thoughts and what we think is best going against what God says because we know better. And this is actually um, part of the reason why the earth was cursed as well, right? So the snake, Adam, and Chava. 
I say Chava, I don't say Eve. I once heard, and I don't know if this is true, but like Eve like is the root of evil because she brought evil into the world. And if you think that she was the mother of all living things and directly created by the hand of God, so might want to check that out. So we will refer to Eve as Chava. Now, um, I also heard something in another place that I read that I just, I thought was really beautiful. I, I wish I could source it for you, but it said something like, it might be from Reb Shlomo, maybe, but um, that the earth knew that man was destined to sin. And so the earth took it upon herself to make the first sin to lessen the punishment of, of men. Because like if you have siblings and once one child disobeys, he gets the harsher punishment than when the second child comes to do it. I don't know what that's rooted in. I don't know the validity of that, but there's something about that that touched my heart. Okay. So, and when Hashem made the grass, the grass remained low and did not grow. Why? Because Hashem desired that after he created Adam, that Adam would see the grass and pray for rain. Um, and we're going to talk about this more. We're going to talk about how important rain is, um, what rain really means, what it's about. Um, there's a source in the book of our heritage. I don't have it offhand, but it says that any day that it rains in Israel is as great as the giving of the Torah. Can you wrap your head around something like that? I can't. Sounds good though. I have my own story to tell you about rain. Remind me. Okay. Next. Um, now, oh, we're going to get into this big time. I might just make a whole video about this. But when the sun and the moon were created on the fourth day, they were actually created at the same size. And the moon spoke to Hashem and said, can two kings wear a single crown? And Hashem said, you're right, make yourself small. And the moon did. And there is so much more to that story. And lastly, let's talk about um, when Hashem said, let us make man. So while going through this process, making everything, God asked the angels, should I? Should I make man? And some said yes, some said no. Um, and in the end, he decided to do it. But what he wanted to teach us was that if a great man thinks that it is superfluous to ask or take a lesser man's advice, he is mistaken. And again, to show his great modesty, he asked those around him what they thought which is definitely a great lesson for us. Also, and this is very important, when, when Hashem was giving the Torah over to Moshe and he came across this verse, let us make man, Moshe was like, um, master of the universe, uh, you're giving people the opportunity to err and think that you had help in creation. And Hashem said, right as I told you, if somebody wishes to err, he will find a pretext to do so. He doesn't need this reason. He'll find his own reason, which is absolutely true. Okay, we are almost finished. Go on, I'm not giving you everything. I'm just giving you a little taste. You're going to have to go and quench your own thirst with the plethora of work that is available to those who love to learn and study. Okay, so we're just going to finish with this. Um, 
Oh, also, when we're talking about how God made us in his image, something, it's always going back to the same things. It's a cycle, okay? What is one of the ways, one of the biggest ways that we are created in the image of God? Because we are medabers, we are speakers. And if you've learned anything that I've said a bazillion times, how does that make us like God? Because our words are a creative act just as his words were a creative act. Um, okay, and lastly, for this video, there's just so much here. It's so, mm, yum. Okay, 10 things were created on Erev Shabbat. So that's gonna be the day before Shabbat, but remember that our night starts our day starts in the night, okay? Um, and why is this so amazing? Because I say that all the time. Because we also, in so many different situations in our life, we start in the dark. And then it becomes light. We start in the darkness. Things start in the darkness. Things that we don't understand. We start in the dark and then comes the light. So Shabbos starts Friday night, right? So Erev Shabbos is really going to be Thursday night to Friday morning till sunset, right? Um, and also I want to give you another of... Um, something that, that's really meaningful to me. And I want you to imagine your life or a particular hardship or trial that you're going through as a staircase, okay? And, and, and that each step of the staircase starts in darkness and then graduates up to light, okay? So sometimes you're going through something or you're working on changing something about yourself. You wanna be different, you wanna be better, you wanna come closer to God so many different things you want to be a better parent you want to be a better spouse and you're working and you're working and you're working and you're really working and you feel like you're just treading water you're not moving and uh, the best example i've ever heard of this is that you're you're on one step you're working 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 you're starting in the darkness you get to a little bit of light and then you're back in the darkness and you think i haven't done anything but that is not true you moved up an entire step. It's just the bottom of that step is darkness and you're gonna work up back toward the light. You're gonna feel like you're making progress and then you're gonna be thrown back in the darkness, but it's not because you're staying in the same place. Um, also, uh, I have to add, anything good or meaningful that you hear me say, I took from another place, it is totally not my own in any way. It's things that I've read, things that I've heard, things that I've studied. Um, and if you ever hear something that doesn't make sense or does not sound right, that's probably my own tune sense to be, to be honest about that. Okay, so let's finish. 10 things that were created um, before Shabbat. The first Shabbat. One, the opening of the earth, the mouth of the earth which would be used to swallow Korach and um, his followers. Two, the opening of the well. Um, this is the miraculous well of Miriam. To, in her merit, followed the nation of Israel through the desert. Three, the mouth of the donkey. So we just did this Parsha, um, and that's when Bilam, the wicked prophet, uh, his donkey spoke to him. And so the mouth of this donkey was created before the first Shabbat for the rainbow because um, it was destined to be a sign and a covenant uh, between Hashem and mankind that he would never flood the earth again. The man, the manna, the holy food that fell from heaven that sustained the nation of Israel while they were in the wilderness for 40 years the rod, the staff of Moshe, that he would use to perform miracles in the future. 
um, the shamir. The shamir is a special kind of worm, okay, that, w this is really hard to, I remember the first time I heard about this, I was like, what? It's a worm that cut stone because um, you, metal wasn't used to cut any of the rocks of the temple because metal is usually a sign of war right and strife but the house of god the bed of mcdash the temple is a place of peace and so there was a special worm that they use that cut these these rocks nine the script the character of the alphabet aleph base the alphabet the alphabet um again i i think i'll go ahead and leave it in the description alone um uh, below again there is an amazing book called um, Wisdom in Hebrew Letters. When we're talking about letters of Hebrew, it's mind boggling. And don't even make me take you in the rabbit hole of Gematria yet. Okay. Uh, next, the engraver. Hashem also conceived the first instrument to engrave letters on stone and then finally the luchot okay the luchot are the two tablets that the ten commandments were inscribed upon the first was a gift from hashem the second ones uh moshe had to make because an unfortunate incident involving a golden calf all right so that I think that's it. And then, and then on the seventh day, God rested. And it's always funny when I hear that phrase, like God rested, right? Have you ever asked yourself, does God need to rest? Does God need to rest? Obviously not. <laughs> Obviously it does not. But and, um, something else I heard that I think is so beautiful um, that I don't know, it just makes sense to me. That's why I like the Midrash because it, it connects to me on a very personal level, right? In our daily lives, we're so many different things, uh, all of us. Um, I'm a mother, uh, I'm a wife, I'm, um, I'm a YouTube video maker, I'm um, an acupressurist, I'm a singer, I'm a friend, I'm a Jew, I'm, I'm, I'm so many different facets of myself. And so if I am, then God surely must be, right? Because he is eternal, so he is eternally multifaceted. And that he, he is our Father in heaven. He is our lover. He is our creator. He is our source. He, on and on and on and on. Um, but he's also him. And so on Shabbat, he just goes back just to being him. He's not the, I mean, he always is, but let's get up into these kind of like lofty ideas, right? He's, he's just him. He's just being him, going back to just and saying, today, love me for me. Don't love me because I'm the king of the universe. Don't love me because I'm the creator of all things. Don't love me because I'm the one that provides you. Don't love me because I'm the one that gives you everything. Today, just love me like me. I think that um, we all want to be loved like that in one way or the other. Thank you for st sticking around. I was going to say sticking around, hanging around, staying around. Um, midrash. Next up. Adam and Chava, please, if you have a chance, like this video. Um, and if you really like this video, subscribe. We're going on a sweet, sweet journey of Midrash. And until we meet again, friends, I look forward to dancing with you at the temple. And as always, Tov Lahodot Hashem.